Hey there, and welcome to Northeast. I'm CJ, and I'm so excited you've joined us for church today. Right now, we are in our series on the book of James, and my good friend Melinda is going to preach a powerful sermon on overcoming adversity, and I know you're going to love it. Later on in service, we're going to take communion together as a family, so if you've got those items, go ahead and grab them, and we'll take communion later on. But right now, we're going to kick off service in my favorite way, and that's with some singing. So let's do that together right now. Well, hey there, welcome to Northeast. It's good to see you all. My name's CJ, I'm one of the pastors here on staff. I am so excited that you have joined us today. We're in a series on the book of James and uh, my friend Melinda is gonna deliver a powerful message here in just a little bit. But right now, as we kick off worship, I wanna invite you to stand with me. I'm gonna read out of Psalm 95. It's just a good reminder of why we, were, why we are here and why we're gathering to worship. It says, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come to him with thanksgiving. Let us sing psalms of praise to him. For the Lord is a great God, a great king above all gods. He holds in his hands the depths of the earth and the mightiest mountains. The sea belongs to him for he made it. He for, his hands formed the dry land too. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people he watches over, the flock under his care. Let's sing to him, let's praise him, and uh, let's do that together right now. Nothing compares 
You know, there was a season in my life where that song would just reduce me to a puddle. Because at the very core of that song is this beautiful message that God is waiting for you. He wants you to run to him. He's waiting for you with arms open wide, not with judgment, condemnation, but with love. And that is what we celebrate in this time of communion. That's when we can look to the cross. That's how we know God wants us to run back to him, just like the prodigal son. No matter if you're close to God or far from God, he wants your heart and he wants you to run back to him. In 2 Corinthians 5, it says, anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life has gone and a new life has begun. And all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. That's what we celebrate in this time that we were far from God. Through our sinful nature, we have chosen to wander away from God, but God bridged the gap to bring us back, to reconcile us with him. So let's take the bread right now, which represents the body of Jesus broken for us, and let's eat it. Let's take the juice, which represents the blood of Christ, and let's drink that together. Will you pray with me? God, in this moment, we simply say thank you. We are simply in awe of your beautiful plan, your grand plan, something that we couldn't possibly have come up with on our own. God, we thank you for the cross. We thank you that though we choose to wander, you're always there waiting for us with arms open wide. God, we thank you, and it's what we remember in this time. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, right now in a time of offering, uh, I just want to highlight the fact that we are in this ser series on the book of James, talking about adversity. And some of us are just going through, going through it right now, through some different difficult challenges. We sang that song earlier where it said, God, you are good, and for some of us, it was a little bit hard to sing that with just what we're facing. And you know what, that's okay. And there's a bunch of other folks here who are also going through challenging seasons and we wanna be a place where you can come and find encouragement and find hope and find friends. And that's what our care and support workshop is really all about. We're offering it every Wednesday through this series. We had one last Wednesday. We'll have another the next two Wednesdays. It'll just be a time for you to come here a little bit of teaching, sit around some circles, meet some other people who are going through it as well. So whether you're dealing with loss or grief or addiction, uh, any of these issues, we invite you to join us. You can find out more information and sign up for that at necchurch.org slash events and click on that care and support uh, tile there. You can find out all the information, all the times and places. Last week was powerful. I know the next two weeks are going to be powerful as well. And if you are somebody who is thinking, well, maybe I ought to go to that or I don't know, maybe my stuff is just too bad. This is your nudge. Join us. I promise your stuff isn't too bad. Come join us. It'll be powerful. And all of this is, is made possible through your giving. So we appreciate your giving. Thank you so much for doing that. You know, another part of this season is just that things are super, super busy. We are uh, kicking off summer, right? A bunch of folks are at the lake. I see you online, people. We know where you are. It's okay. It's all right. 
The other thing probably most excitedly that we are celebrating is graduation season. So right now we wanna take just a quick moment in, our, in our, ser- our service here to recognize the folks that have put in all the hard work, have written all the papers and have read all the books, right? So if you are somebody in the last few weeks who has graduated from high school or from college or from graduate school, would you please stand up so that we can honor and celebrate you today? And stay standing, stay standing. And if you are the parent or spouse of one of those graduates, would you stand up as well so we can honor and celebrate you? We know it's been a long road. We know it's been a lot of work. And you know what, class of 2022, you've already heard one corny speech about uh, changing the world. So I'll spare you another one. We just want you to know your Northeast family is so proud of you. We want to congratulate you. Job well done. Congratulations, graduates. Right now, we are going to turn and experience somebody making the most important decision of their life. So let's turn our attention over to the baptistry. Good morning. We're Amy and Eric Pierce, and this is our son, Levi. And we've been coming to Northeast for about a year and a half. Um, During that time, Levi has made a profession of faith and we have slowed him down and um, tried to be sure that he was ready. And through COVID and through the restrictions and just his health issues, just a lot of things that we had, um, we just wanted to be sure we were ready. And he has persisted and insisted that I need to be at church. I need to be with young people. I need to sing, I need to know Jesus. And it has just become more real to us that it's time that we've slowed his role as long as we can. And um, when you talk to him for five minutes, he just is, He's ready, so we're here to celebrate with him. Okay, okay. are you ready? Okay. Please repeat after us. Okay. I believe. I believe. I believe. Jesus, Jesus is the Christ. That Jesus is the Christ. The Son, of the, the God, God, the Son of the living God. The Son of the living God. And I accept him. And I accept him. As my Lord and Savior. As my Lord and Savior. Okay. Upon that good confession, we baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I hope we never forget what an honor it is to get to be a part of that moment in his life. Just standing here, sitting here, watching him. That's a celebration for all of us. This morning, we are continuing in our sermon series about overcoming adversity. If you were here with us last week, we looked at uh, James chapter one and specifically focused on the ways in which James teaches, James teaches us that we are to respond the moment that we are faced with a trial or some kind of testing or tribulation or temptation in our lives. So if you were not here last week, I would love to challenge you to go back and listen to that because today we are continuing to work our way through the book of James. We're jumping over to chapter three, where towards the end of the chapter, James really focuses on the importance of maturing in wisdom and what that should look like in our lives. So that is what our conversation is about today. And I want to start by sharing sharing um, a story of a conversation that happened in my life um, about nine years ago, almost to the day uh, when my oldest daughter, Amelia, was born. Uh, She was born in May, and I took about six weeks of maternity leave and then came back to work, and it was my first day back in the office. And if any new parent can remember those first few months of uh, figuring out what that looks like, it's it's chaotic, you're excited to be around adults, but you're also terrified to not be with your infant. It's a very confusing um, season in life, and I remember a moment of my first day back when a coworker, a friend, her name is Rosemary, um, she looked at me, and you know how when someone looks at you, you kind of feel like they're looking deep down into your soul because you just know that they see you for who you are in that moment. And Rosemary asked me, she said, well, what are you doing right now to, to keep Jonathan, my husband, um, a priority? What are you doing to invest in your marriage right now? And I remember laughing out loud at that question because it just felt completely ludicrous. Like I have a newborn baby, how in the world would I be making him a priority right now? And um, I remember her like not laughing at my laughter and saying like, 
Well, you just need to remember that one day Amelia is not going to be living in your home anymore and Jonathan still will be and you have to make that a priority. And in that moment, I did not enjoy that conversation. Not one little bit, but if you'll notice, that conversation has stuck with me over the last nine years. You see, in that moment, it wasn't a conversation that I just dismissed because she didn't have the right to say that to me. She had earned the right. Um, she had earned my trust. She had um, the, the position in my life to speak truth to me and she was willing to do that. She thought, you know, this is an opportunity for me to hold her accountable just in case no one else is in this area of her life. And the reason I'm starting by telling you that story is because that is uh, very similar to what James is about to do with us in chapter three of his letter. He's about to make us pretty uncomfortable. He's about to hold us accountable. He's about to say some things that maybe we don't want to hear Trust me, I don't want to say them, um, but I hope that if you are someone who um, appreciates that type of approach in, in a relationship, in a friendship with someone, I hope that you'll appreciate today. And if not, I just want to challenge you to open, um, soften your heart and see what it is that God has for you in James's words. So we are going to start, I'm just going to read to you the entire passage that we're working through today as a whole, and then we're going to go back through it verse by verse. So here's what he says, starting in verse 13 of chapter three. He says, if you are wise and understand God's ways, prove it by living an honorable life, doing good works with the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you are bitterly jealous and there is selfish ambition in your heart, don't cover up the truth with boasting and lying. For jealousy and selfishness are not God's kind of wisdom. Such things are earthly, unspiritual, and demonic for wherever there is jealousy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder and evil of every kind. But the wisdom from above is first of all pure. It's also peace-loving, gentle at all times, and willing to yield to others. It is full of mercy and the fruit of good deeds. It shows no favoritism and is always sincere. And those who are peacemakers will plant seeds of peace and reap a harvest of righteousness. I mentioned that today we're talking about maturing in wisdom and what that looks like. So it might not have surprised you to hear that we read the word wisdom four times in this very short passage of scripture. James is pointing out to us that for most of us, there's a good chance that we are leaning more heavily toward one type of wisdom. There's godly wisdom and there's ungodly wisdom. You can't do both. So today we're going to figure out where your life is, is more heavily leaning right now and see if there's an adjustment that needs to be made. Uh, we have an opportunity for that reset to determine if the path that we're currently on will lead us toward the kind of wisdom that James is urging us to pursue because this passage is extremely clear about what can happen in our lives if we choose to pursue ungodly wisdom. When you and I try to overcome adversity, it takes God's wisdom to make that possible at all. We cannot and we should not do it on our own. So today is a reminder of the wisdom it's gonna take for us to overcome adversity with godly wisdom and with a kingdom mindset instead of one that more mirrors what the world and the earth tells us to do. So I'm going to read to, uh, to you verse 13 again. It says, if you are wise and understand God's ways, prove it by living an honorable life, doing good works with the humility that comes from wisdom. So I want to ask you a question. When you hear the word wisdom, who or what comes to mind? Is it, a, is it that, that one person you used to know in high school who got a PhD in biochemistry? Is it a person who has reached an expertise level in their field of interest? Who is the wisest person that you know? If I were to ask you to figure out in this room uh, amongst Christians, who's the, who's the wisest Christian in this room? What criteria do you think that we would use to determine that? Well, there's a good chance that we might base someone's wisdom on how much knowledge they have without even thinking about looking at the way that they live, the way that they serve other people, the way that they treat the people around them. This verse tells us that a wise person is not necessarily the one with the most knowledge. It's in fact, the one with the most humility. 
That is how we can identify how wise a person is. You see, the problem with figuring out who the wisest person in the room is without looking at the heart of a person is all we're looking at is how much information they've gathered in their mind. But there's, it's very possible to gather a whole lot of knowledge and information in our minds without ever letting it transform our hearts. And that is the heart of what James is getting at in this verse. So what is the difference between godly wisdom and ungodly wisdom? Let's establish some really basic definition right now uh, just so that we understand what we're talking about. Well, godly wisdom means that you're striving to see life from God's perspective and acting according, accordingly, not being swayed by others. There's a heaven focus in this kind of wisdom. Ungodly wisdom is striving to see life from the world's perspective and basing everything on one's own individual experience or that of the people around them. You're more worldly focused. Throughout the book of James, wisdom is a theme that he frequently comes back to. We actually talked about it last week in chapter one, verse five, that says, if you need wisdom, ask our generous God and he will give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking. We know that we need to ask God for wisdom, but we're not always eager to do that. And even when we do ask God for his wisdom, sometimes we're not even really sure if we want to hear what he's got to say because we've already decided on our own how we're gonna do things anyway. So if we're gonna ask for it, we have to be willing to receive it. I wanna read this verse 13 one more time before we move on. It says, if you are wise and understand God's ways, prove it. By living an honorable life, doing good works with the humility that comes from wisdom. Let's talk a little bit more about humility. A wise person doesn't, in fact, know everything. And I love that being humble, actually, being humble means that you admit that you don't know everything. It means that when there's a topic in your life that you just don't know how to handle, whether it's parenting or marriage or conflict, friendships, if there's grief in your life, if you're facing an addiction or a diagnosis that you just don't know how to handle, Showing humility in the middle of that means that you're willing to go out and ask for help or you're willing to acquire the knowledge and the understanding that you need to get a better sense of where you're at. Now, the opposite of humility is arrogance. And some of you immediately thought of that one person in your life who you know is arrogant. But I want to ask you for a moment to just look in the mirror and really think about times in your life where arrogance has popped up because I think it happens to all of us. I know it happens to me. You see, arrogance is the belief that I know what I know and I know what I'm supposed to know. And in fact, I also know what you're supposed to know. And I don't care what I don't know because I already know what I know and I know that I'm right. But you see, this this funny thing happens as we get older, either in years or we get older in wisdom, and we realize that it turns out I didn't actually know anything at all to begin with. We have such an opportunity to really look in the mirror today and discover what it is that James is needing us to, to realize, maybe for the very first time, because true wisdom and true humility can be seen in our character and can be seen in the fruit that we produce in our lives. It's, it's something in you that only God can do, only God can produce. You see, what can happen when we rely or depend on our arrogance to get us through something, it leads to what we read in verse 14 that says, but if you are bitterly jealous and there is selfish ambition in your heart, don't cover up the truth with boasting and lying. In this verse, James is calling us to self-examination, similarly to how Rosemary did with me nine years ago. James is essentially asking, you know, what's really going on in your heart right now? Why does it feel like there's this bitterness or this envy or this selfish ambition that's taking over and that's keeping you from letting God speak wisdom into your life? What is it that's stirring up inside of you? So not only is James asking you that question, but I want to ask you that question today. What is really going on inside of your heart? Is there something in your life that just is keeping you from truly allowing godly wisdom to rule in the ways that you make decisions and the ways that you're living, the ways that you're treating other people? What's keeping you from keeping your eyes focused only on Jesus? 
Verse 15 says, for jealousy and selfishness are not God's kind of wisdom. Such things are earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. It's not a coincidence that in this, in this short passage, uh, three separate times, James talks about being selfish and jealous. This is only the second of those three times, so we're not done yet. But the point he's trying to make is that when we're only pursuing ungodly wisdom in our lives, the reality is the fruits of that, or the result of that is going to be jealousy and selfish ambition. It results with us being more focused on ourselves and not able to think about anything or anyone else other than our own personal agenda. I told you, James is not messing around in this passage, and I'm sure you're all just so glad you came to church today. <laughs> Verse 16, he mentions jealousy and selfish ambition for a third time when he says, for wherever there is jealousy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder and evil of every kind. The fruits of jealousy and selfish ambition, this verse tells us, is chaos and disorder. And we know that our God is not a God of disorder, not just because of what James teaches us, but when we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 14, it literally says, for God is not a God of disorder, but he is a God of peace. The harsh truth and reality that James is trying to wake us up to today is that we all face consequences in our lives when we allow ourselves to feel jealous or to feel that selfish ambition at times. And here are just a few of the consequences that we might experience in our lives. Do any of these sound familiar to you? Feeling discontent with what we have, experiencing resentment toward God, experiencing resentment toward others. We've believed the lie that ungodly wisdom and the world tells us that we can do our own thing our own way and somehow that will all turn out just fine, right? That's fine, it's fine, everything's fine. That's, that's what we say. But God wants to give us peace. Our God is a God of peace. He does not put disorder in our lives. It doesn't mean that things aren't going to be difficult at times and that we're not going to face challenges and things are still going to feel uncomfortable, but God is not the one who's in there stirring up disorder in our lives. So if we feel like we can't get out of this chaos or this way of living in a, in a disordered way, I have to ask you to think about what type of wisdom you're truly pursuing in your life. You know, one of the most accessible tools that God has given us to help us learn and realize what it looks like to follow godly wisdom is the people who we allow into our lives. So I wanna challenge you right now to think about the people who have the most opportunity to speak wisdom into your life. Do you think that they are constantly pointing you to God in the advice, the suggestion, the direction, that they're, they're leading you? Or are they more telling you, you know, just do what feels right, just do what you wanna do? Who are the people who have that permission and that right to speak into you? And how are they molding you and shaping you? Because whether you realize it or not, those are the people who are discipling you. Let's talk about what types of ungodly wisdom people might be offering us. And for the record, not only are there people in our lives who might be put, offering this to us, but there's a chance some of us are offering this type of ungodly wisdom to other people because here's the harsh truth. Jealous people who, lead, who will lead you on a path that tells you to just take what he has instead of a path that asks, how can I just celebrate that good things are happening in his life? Um, God, ungodly wisdom um, looks like selfish people who encourage you to follow the motto, you do you, in an attempt to put your own needs and wants above everyone else. Liars who distort the truth, usually for flattery or attention seeking. Gossipers who take what you share confidentially and use it to gain social power with others. None of us ever intend to live that way. But when it comes to overcoming adversity, typically in those situations, we find ourselves in high stress, complicated situations that gives us this propensity to become someone that we are not proud of. And it requires an incredible amount of strength and self-awareness and emotional health to make sure we're not surrounding ourselves with people who influence our attitudes and the way that we treat the people around us. Andy Andrew is an author, a female pastor who I follow, and um, she said this recently. Uh, she said, walk, stand, and sit with encouragers and those who give life. 
I've learned that when we keep company with the mockers long enough, we simply become one. Have any of us in this room kept company with the mockers long enough that we've allowed ourselves to become more like that? And what do we need to do to change the spaces where we're allowing ourselves to be? If you're heading toward a place of living in sin, sitting in that sin comfortably as if it's not a big deal, it's time for us to switch directions because ungodly wisdom is only gonna allow that sin to abound in our lives. And James is reminding us that it actually won't be all right. It's not okay to be living this way when we have an opportunity to move toward the godly wisdom that's being offered to us today. What good can really come out of living a way that's keeping you moving in a different direction from where God wants you to be? Last week, we introduced you to Katie and Aaron. And Katie and Aaron, uh, throughout this series, are sharing their story with us in three parts. So we heard the first part last week. That's another plug to get you to go back and listen to the message from last week um, so you can catch up on, um, on who Katie and Aaron are. And they have been brave and bold enough in this series to share their story, uh, to share about Aaron's alcoholism and how it um, really impacted their lives and continues to impact their lives and his journey to recovery. And um, today we have the incredible privilege uh, to hear from not only Katie and Aaron, but also Danny, who's a part of their small group. And um, I'm just so excited for us to watch this, listen to this story, thinking about the ways in which they've leaned on godly wisdom, surrounded themselves with people pursuing godly wisdom to help them get through times of adversity. I do want to give a content warning uh, before the video starts. Um, about two minutes into the video, as Aaron is sharing his story, uh, there is a, a brief mention of thoughts that he had of ending his life. And we realize that for some of you, that is a trigger and that is an unsafe space for you to be in. And if that describes you in any way, we, we strive to be a place where we break the stigma around mental health. So if you need to step out, if you need to turn off the stream, we want you to feel like you have the freedom and you have no judgment in that space if that is what you need to do to protect yourself. Uh, the video is about seven minutes long, so we hope that you can rejoin us after. Um, but if you need a safe space to process and talk to someone and help, we'll, um, be pointed to professional help, we'd love to do that with you. So so um, that being said, let's listen to Katie and Aaron's story right now. It's funny thinking back at whenever it all first started, there was this event that they had at church where, you know, that we joke and say that it was speed dating for friends, you know, and where we basically, we just went into this room and, you know, there was a bunch of people looking to do, you know, the small groups and, you know, and things like that. And before it even started, Katie and I were out in the car and just looked at each other. It was like, why don't we just go get some Mexican food and just leave? I was like, this is just weird. It's like, so it's like, why don't we just go home? And it, it's so weird that that one, that one little moment could have changed the course of our entire lives. I still remember the, the day that we, um, that we were sitting in, you know, the kitchen, you know, talking about it with, with the other people and, I admitted to him that I was an alcoholic, and um, we told him that Katie and I were going to go through a legal separation, and we didn't know where it was going to go. So we had been meeting for, you know, roughly a little over a year, and Aaron and Katie brought it up at one of our small group meetings. And I mean, I can't imagine how difficult that was for them at that point. Um, it, it was super brave and, um, you know, just super vulnerable of them to be able to, to talk about that and for them to be asking for our prayer and for our support and for our help. It wasn't a magical word. You know, it wasn't that, you know, these part people were coming up and saying, we got this, you know, we're going we're gonna to do this and we're going to do that. They were just there. We didn't need just somebody telling us that this is what we're going to do to fix it. We needed somebody that was going to be right beside us saying that, we don't know what it's gonna look like, but we're gonna be there beside you to help you out. After we spoke to him, told him what was going on, um, I had about a month, five, actually five, almost five weeks to the day um, where I wasn't drinking. Um, I'd actually had an intensive outpatient you know, process that I went through and all those kinds of things. And again, I thought things were shaping up. So I was at home alone and um, basically decided to get a little bit of beer, you know, and um, so I did. I got, you know, 
I think I got a six pack at the time, flew through the six pack like that. And I knew right away that this, that wasn't gonna be enough. Aaron was supposed to go spend time with his family um, in Eastern Kentucky. And, you know, I was, we had chatted on that Saturday while I was traveling, everything seemed pretty okay. Um, on Sunday when I found out he wasn't in Eastern Kentucky, I was like, hmm, this seems odd. You would have, you were supposed to go in. You told me you were going to. Um, he was like, no, I just, you know, I just kind of wanted to stay home. I have to work the next day. I'm okay. Um, and on Monday, he stopped responding. Katie called us and you know said have you been able to get a hold of Aaron I haven't been able to get a hold of him he was supposed to he told us all different things that he was supposed to be doing like he told Brent he was supposed to be golfing with his dad he told Tom he was going to go to a baseball game um, and then I texted him and he wouldn't respond so I think it was myself and Luke that went over to the house through all of these past years I my gut tells me everything and I my gut said something is wrong and I said, I think, I think you guys are gonna have to go check on him. She's like, all right. I was tired of fighting. Um, there's just no way I can possibly live like this. And, and I was in the closet of our bedroom um, thinking about killing myself. We're literally banging on the door and you know, had to threaten uh, police uh, intervention, had to threaten, we're gonna break down the door. Um, and, and then we just prayed, please, God, if he has any strength whatsoever, just let him open the door. Don't know how I got to the door. Don't know how any of that happened. Um, but once I got there, I just fell apart. Told him I couldn't do it anymore. And there's one moment from that entire thing that I remember. And I don't know who said it, um, but I remember them saying that, um, I know you can't, but we can do it together. And I blacked out. We got him to the hospital, um, and there was, you know, there's, there's things you can do to make sure that they stay in the hospital. Well, Aaron is a very smart guy, and he's a very uh, charming man, and he can talk his way out of things, and he did, and he got home. So we had to go back and then get him and take him back downtown. And, you know, he was, he was obviously completely, um, just mortified of what was going on when he started to you know sober up and realize things but he also thought that he may be able to take care of this himself and you know so it took a lot of hard conversations to let him know that no you can't handle this yourself we're gonna have to get you some help he arranged a 30-day treatment facility for me to go to and at first I was not up for it I was not having it and um, <laughs> found out pretty quick that this wasn't an option you know this is something that that you're gonna do. Once Aaron went to the facility, those ladies were amazing. Um, they would come over, um, they would help me bathe the kids. We would go on walks, they would bring me dinner. Um, I ended up having to have emergency gallbladder surgery during that time too. Um, so they were there during all of that. It really took all of us into me, man. That's. It, it was just a beautiful picture of what the church should be for each other. And everybody was willing, and it didn't put anybody out. And it, we were just doing it out of love for Aaron and Katie. You've removed the stigma of having secrets. I mean, you've basically, you've got people in your life where you can say anything to them, and they're not gonna judge you one bit about it. When I can say that it's, it's, it's saved my life, I, it's not, it's not, you know, I'm not just making that up. I mean, it's something where I legitimately would have either killed myself or would have been killed by this disease. Um, not only that, our marriage. I mean, our marriage would, by, I mean, absolutely had no shot, no shot of working out had it not been for them being in our life. I just can't imagine our life without him because my life and his life would be so completely different if they weren't here. Um, and that's one of those moments where, again, we could have went and got Mexican food and not gone to small group gathering, but we chose to do it. And it was the biggest turning point in our life that we just didn't know yet.
I think Danny um, summed it all up perfectly. He said a, a beautiful picture of what the church should be. And sometimes the greatest blessings in our lives are the people God sends to us who protect us, teach us, and encourage us along the way. They're not only there to love us in those moments, but they're there to model what it looks like for us to love ourselves again. I wanna um, read a few lines from the story that just really have stuck with me over the last week. Um, Danny said, as he and Luke were standing at the door, hoping that Aaron would come to the door, um, they prayed, uh, God, if he has any strength at all, just let him open the door. And from the moment that I heard um, Danny say those words, I, I want you to know that that's been our prayer for, for all of you in this, in this series. If you're facing something right now, if you have any strength at all, will you just open the door and let someone in? Let a, a trusted, safe person in your life, uh, if it's a pastor, if it's a, a person at this church, if it's coming Wednesday night to just talk about what's going on, will you just open the door and let someone in? Aaron described his experience with this intentional community that I hope you heard them say that they came to church and, and got placed in this group randomly without really knowing what was going on. And they sat out in their car and thought about going to get Mexican food instead, but they didn't. They made the choice to step intentionally into community. And here's how he described it. He said about how they showed up for them during this time. It wasn't a magical word that they said, they were just there. We didn't need someone to fix it, but someone to say, we don't know what it's gonna look like, but we're not leaving. And that speaks directly to what we've been talking about today when it comes to um, humility making you the wisest person in the room. It's being willing to say, I have no idea what you need right now, but I'm gonna stay here with you every step of the way. This is the kind of godly wisdom that James wants us to pursue in our lives, the kind that shows us what it looks like to, to consistently keep our eyes and keep the eyes of the people around us focused on God. So how do we chase after that and develop it in our lives? How do we take what James is saying and figure out how this applies and truly can help us overcome adversity? I wanna read to you again verses 17 and 18 from James chapter three. Uh, we, we heard these verses at the beginning of our conversation, but as I read them this time, I want you to think specifically about what you just watched in this story and how much you might find that it really lines up with what it looks like to show godly wisdom in your life. Here's what James said. He said, but the wisdom from above is first of all pure. It's also peace loving, gentle at all times, it's willing to yield to others. It is full of mercy and the fruit of good deeds. It shows no favoritism and is always sincere. And those who are peacemakers will plant seeds of peace and reap a harvest of righteousness. I want you to think about the ways that God showed up in Katie and Aaron's story through their community around them, leading them to godly wisdom by showing, uh, being gentle, being peace loving, willing to yield to others, full of mercy and good deeds, always sincere. What are the stories in your own life of when you've seen this play out, when you've had to rely on God's strength and God's wisdom to get you through a situation? How do some of these words resonate with ways that you handle and respond to adversity in your life? In a way, this is kind of like James's version of the fruit of the spirit. Um, and I wish there was like a catchy song I could teach you, like the one we learned when we were three, the fruit of the spirit, to help us remember these, but I don't know of a song, so maybe one of you can write one. Um, but what do each of these these words mean. I want to take the seven characteristics of godly wisdom and really make sure we have a clear understanding of what this can and should look like in our lives. The first word is pure. James said the wisdom from above is first of all pure. Well, something that's pure, someone who's pure, looks like they're walking in integrity. They're walking toward wholeness. He also said the wisdom from above is peace loving. It means refusing to awaken and incite anger in others. The wisdom from above is gentle. That means that it is considerate and with a soft temperament. The wisdom from above yields to others, which looks like valuing and accepting other people's feelings, opinions, and suggestions. 
The wisdom from above is full of mercy and good deeds, which means if we're faithful to God's word, we will produce fruit in his name. Got a couple more there. The wisdom from above shows no favoritism, which means, means that we remain impartial. We treat everyone the same. And the wisdom from above is sincere, which means being transparent about our weaknesses. Is there one of these that, that kind of jumped out at you as something that maybe you need to work on cultivating and strengthening in your life? I'm not gonna suggest that you need to improve on all seven of these things, but maybe there's just one that you can identify you need more of in your life. We need all of them. But today I wanna give you some homework I apologize at the nine o'clock for giving homework, but I'm actually not sorry at all. I love giving homework. So um, I want to challenge you. I want to ask you this week to spend a few minutes working through some questions for reflection. Um, and I would love nothing more than to see everyone take out their phone and take a picture when these questions pop up on the screen because these questions are designed to help you really figure out where you're at right now when it comes to pursuing godly wisdom in your life and hopefully help you figure out what you still need to, to strengthen or to cultivate right now. So if we can pop up these questions, I wanna read through these with you. Maybe one will jump out. If you just remember one of these questions, that's a win. Number one, pure. Is there an area of your life that needs to be cleaned out and made pure? Number two, peace loving. Do you create calm or chaos in your conversations? Can you think about the last few difficult or tense conversations you had with people? Did you create calm in those moments or did you actually create more chaos? Number three, gentle. Are you reasonable in the requests that you demand of others? The description for gentle talked about having a soft temperament. How soft and gentle is your temperament when you're interacting with other people? Number four, yield to others. In what area of your life might you need to grow and learn more? Where can you humble yourself? Maybe you just can't figure out how to have a conversation about a polarizing issue and maybe just learning a little bit more about how someone in your life views that topic could really help cultivate some wisdom. Number five, full of mercy and good deeds. How do you offer compassion to those in distress? And if you can't think of the last time that you offered compassion, to someone in distress, then that might be where you start today. Number six, no favoritism. Does everyone experience you in the same loving way, whether you're at work or the grocery store or church or home, are you treating everyone with the same type of love? And number seven, sincere. What are you hiding from others? Is there something that you need to open the door about and just let someone in and be honest about what you're facing right now? You know, pursuing godly wisdom is increasingly countercultural in a world that screams and celebrates selfish ambition. I love the way that James closes out this chapter in verse 18 when he reminds us that the kind of faith we're talking about, the kind of wisdom we're urging you to pursue is one that produces blessing and righteousness. Here's how he finishes this chapter. He says, and those who are peacemakers will plant seeds of peace and reap a harvest of righteousness. Can you think for just a moment about all the seeds of peace that were planted in Aaron and Katie's life by their community? that came around them, planting seeds every step of the way. Can you think about the seeds of peace that have been planted in your life that can help you find the strength to lean on the godly wisdom that we're talking about today that James so desperately wants us to pursue? Our world is desperate for peace and the wisdom of peace we just learned, it brings calm and peace in the midst of disorder. So today, as we close uh, with prayer, I, I hope that you will go to God with me right now and just ask him to be present in your life and give you the courage that it's gonna take to pursue, pursue this kind of godly wisdom that we all need for whenever adversity is gonna pop up in our lives, we can remember what we need to lean on or who we need to lean on in those moments. Will you pray with me? God, we thank you for your wisdom. 
We thank you that it is always present in our lives and we ask that you will never let us forget for one moment that you are right there with us in the midst of our uh, lowest of lows. Um, Sometimes those moments that feel like we just can't see the other side, give us the strength that we need to surround ourselves with people who can give us the wisdom we need to look to you every single time. God, if there's anyone here in this room um, who, who needs to take a step forward, who needs to um, find healing in whatever it is that they are walking through right now, God, please give them the courage and the strength to do exactly that. Uh, we can't overcome adversity without you right by our side. So remind us each and every day that you are right here with us. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Thanks, Melinda. I don't want you to leave here today without knowing how you can take your next best step. That's what we're all about around here. So if you are somebody that needs someone to pray with you, you need somebody that needs that pastor, that friend, that ear, if you brought something in with you today that just feels super extra heavy, uh, I'd love to invite you to our fireside room. It's just outside of this uh, entryway over here across from our nursery. We've got staff and volunteers in there who would love to pray for you and help you get plugged into some resources. If you'd like to know a little bit more about our church or how to sign up for our next round of Northeast Basics, I wanna invite you to the kiosk in the lobby. It's in front of that big metal wall. We've got staff and volunteers there as well who will help you uh, get plugged in and help answer your questions. Again, thanks so much for being here. Go and love the Ville. Dark of the night.